Are you proud to be Hispanic? Hispanics in Florida now have the first Hispanic car license plate in the United States. Be a proud Hispanic. Put the Hispanic plate on your car. I want to be a doctor. I want to be a scientist. I want to be an engineer. I want to be a police officer. I want to be a professional dancer. By getting the Hispanic plate for your car, you will support scholarships and community programs. Call now or visit HispanicAchievers.org. This show is brought to you by Boricua Beer, coming to your local retailer in September. Good evening and welcome to EDU TV. I'm your host, Craig Perkins, and today's guest is Darren Soto, who's the uh, Florida Senate for District 14 in Orlando. So, Thanks um, for having me. Oh, sure, no problem. Thanks for joining us. Uh, so, Darren, tell me about some of the, uh, uh, one of your recent initiatives. I understand that uh, there was a uh, big debate about ESOL students and um, assessment and whether or not those scores should count, considering that some of the kids, they may be intelligent in their native language. However, when you ask a child, when he's only been in school one year, to take a test in another language, that's not fair. So tell me about the work that you've uh, done um, on that cause. Sure, it's, it's no secret in Central Florida and throughout the state that we have great diversity. We have students coming from the Caribbean, Central and South American Asia, and particularly in Central Florida from Puerto Rico, from Haiti, and a few other Caribbean islands. And so it's critical that we give these kids a chance. But at the same time, we have accountability requirements. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to make sure that the kids from Pensacola down to the Keys are getting a similar education. And so we test them for that. But the problem becomes when folks come in f fresh off the boat, for lack mm -hmm. of a better term, and they speak either Creole or Spanish as their first language, we need to give them a little bit of time. You know, when my father came here from Puerto Rico at eight years old, he got off a prop plane with a pair of shorts and a t-shirt and he spoke no English. And it mm -hmm. took him at least two years around third grade to learn. So when I found out that it was only one year um, that our kids got before their FCAT, now the Florida Standards Exam, mm -hmm. counted, which in third grade and in 10th grade are requirements in order uh, to advance and, and to graduate in the latter. And so I thought at the very minimum, we need to increase it. Now, ideally, it would have been three or four years or five years, as a lot of our language experts have confided, uh, is required to really master a language. But you know, in the realm of politics, you have to do what you can and, and, and get changes. You can do it. And we were able to pass legislation that gave them now two years before their Florida standards exams will start counting. Okay. Uh, and so that's a two-year reprieve that won't count against the school, it won't count against the student, it won't count against the teachers, all of which are graded by these high-stakes exams. And then there was a little hubbub because the United States Department of Education didn't want to approve it. And so we had a big battle and we finally got that news in about two months ago that USDOE approved it and so now going into next year these kids will have some time to learn English and, and, and pass these exams. There's also been some um, uh, uh, recent activity by groups such as opt out um, asking their, their students to maybe uh, sit out or they're coming check the kids out of school. What are your views on the current pushback uh, against too much assessment that's going on in Florida right now. Well, they're right on as far as the fact that there's too much assessment in Florida. Uh, uh, the legislation I'm working on this year in the form of amendments with uh, Senator Monford and Representative Placencia deal with making sure that we don't have any course exams for electives anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, gym, art, music. It, it's taking all the interest and intrigue and magic out of these subjects by having required state exams. There was even, uh, I was told, an end of course exam for Italian handball in Orange yeah. County. So yeah. you get an idea that the opt-out folks have, have got it right as far as there's too much testing. But I wouldn't be advising third graders to not take the exam. We shouldn't be politicizing our, our kids that way, um, especially when it could have dire consequences. Sure. Now we just saw today Governor Scott um, suspend the uh, 
the uh, written verbal portion of uh, some of the some of the high stakes exams today to have a reanalysis for the Florida standards exam. And so I think with that coupled with a, a bill coming out of the Senate that would limit it to 10 days worth of testing in total out of the school year, uh, require merit assessments to be only 40 percent. Those are good starts, mm -hmm. but I think we need to do more. I think the key would be that the Florida Standard Exam was a diagnostic exam. It mm -hmm. was there so that parents would know where their students stood vis-a-vis -vis other students in the state. And it really wasn't supposed to be this giant hammer to punish yeah, schools and sure. teachers. So I'd like to see it go back more to that. And I do believe we need end of course exams for core classes, mm -hmm. math, mm -hmm. science, uh, reading and, and, and writing I, and, and civics. I think these are all key courses that we need to continue to, to make sure we have high quality exams for. But I just think we've gone overboard by trying to push it with these electives and, and it's really taking the magic out of this stuff. So you'll see a, a concerted push as well to try to deal with narrowing down the high stakes exams in Florida. How do you think it got so out of control because you're a politician and it seems that a lot of legislators uh, in Tallahassee with people from various points in the state it's almost like they make these rules without consulting the teachers and the educators and they it's it's like they keep giving them more and more and more so are legislators listening to the people say hey can we work more in concert to do what makes sense regarding the assessment well I could tell you first I was listening the whole time I voted against the bill that made end of course exams the way they are I voted against the bill that made teacher merit pay the way it is and uh, those were two pivotal moments uh, and supported the pause for this year on technology so that we have enough time for our schools to get ahead. But the reason I think that a lot of others who supported and pushed these bills um, put them forward was, yeah, they wanted accountability, but they tried to push reforms every year mm -hmm. so that they could have something that they could claim on the reelection. They did to reform education. And, uh, and, and while it sounds good on a mailer, if it's not done right and you don't give schools the time to catch up, then it becomes a failure. Do I think now they're finally listening to this, this growing opposition? Of course, we're seeing that even with an executive order day from the governor with a legislation coming out of the Senate and potentially out of the House as well. But there's a lot of pushback. There's a lot of companies that make a lot of money off this testing. Sure, and, sure. Uh, and when you look into an average meeting of the Senate Education Policy Committee, there are very few parents, very few teachers, and a ton of lobbyists who are trying to push for these various things from high stakes testing to private schools to all these other matters that aren't dealing with just the base public school program. And so if more teachers show up in Tallahassee and more people vote based upon these ideas, there will have to be change and we're already starting to see change now. Mm -hmm. In a perfect world, if uh, you could sort of redesign it in terms of, I know in third grade, uh, kids can be uh, retained and then I know in the 10th grade if they don't make a certain score then they don't uh, graduate. What reforms would you like to see? Do you think it's too much pressure on children to pass these tests in order to graduate? Well life is full of pressure so it's mm -hmm. not to me about pressure ultimately and they do need to uh, take these exams and pass them. However, there are exceptions like I worked on with your last, in, with your future interviewer, uh, mm -hmm. Rick Roach, which yeah. is Kayla's Law, which would deal with high performing students who just get near misses on these exams. Sure. If you're an A performer all year long other than one day mm -hmm. and you come really close, right. like within a few points like Kayla ha did, while her twin brother who didn't do as well mm -hmm. ended up passing, mm -hmm. uh, we should have some limited exceptions for that. Uh, but I do think though, at third grade, the reason we picked that is that's the time period where you've got to read by now. Sure, sure. And if you don't, it, we're, we are shirking a responsibility. So I do think it needs to be passed and near misses, we could have some flexibility with, with high performing students. But a poor performing student mm -hmm. that's not passing the Florida Sanders exam by a mile, mm -hmm. we're not helping that kid by advancing them and, right. and promoting uh, illiteracy in, in our schools. Mm -hmm. With regard to the high school diploma, again, 11th, 10th grade, we picked that for a reason. Mm -hmm. Because we want to make sure these students have the basic knowledge that all other students have when passing high school. So 
while I'm interested in exceptions and flexibility, mm -hmm. I do think they still need to be there for those two key grades to assure quality control and accountability in our school system. Mm -hmm. And so, what do you do? You still think it should be a state's issue because now there's a, a, a big thing with Jeb Bush possibly considering a run for the president in terms of the whole idea about Common Core standards. Do you think that it should remain more of a state's issue? And the other side of that argument is that, okay, why should a kid in New York know more than a kid who lives in Florida? So what are your thoughts on that? Well, my thought is, one, the Common Core regime is already a state's issue because each state has to adopt the education system. Now, to get race to the top money, you had to have certain accountability measures, but you did not have to adopt the Common Core testing if you didn't want to. Now, in Florida, there's been a slight deviation with the Florida standards, not much. It's mostly in a name. Is that a name only? Yeah. Mostly in a name, but there's some slight differences mm -hmm. in it. So I think in the United States, we are the United States for a reason. Each mm -hmm. state is supposed to have some discretion on, on issues, particularly education is one of those. The federal government, until No Child Get Left Behind, didn't get really involved in education other than in funding things in Title I schools, such as free and reduced lunch, such as after school tutors, but they were primarily a funder, not a policy maker. Mm -hmm. That changed with No Child Left Behind with George W. Bush, and, and uh, so I think, yes, the states still need a role in this, and I would oppose any effort by Jeb Bush or anybody else to try to continue to try to nationalize education policy. If you think New York has a better education system, mm -hmm. then you can move to New York. If you think it's better down here in Florida, then then you have that choice. And I think ultimately, through transparency of which schools are doing better on national exams, such as the SAT, that's going to give parents options on to where they want to live. Mm -hmm. But I think at the end of the day, states traditionally ran the education systems for a reason, to have someone closer to the home to make those decisions. And I think while we have the options to look at national ideas, it still should be left to the states. OK, but I, I guess the, the other side of that they would say since we live in a pretty much a global community because people are constantly coming and going they're saying that these national standards are necessary in order for us to be competitive globally and so uh, what if you get a governor in a state who maybe wants to lower standards to make himself uh, look better is that maybe robbing uh, the child of uh, education well first education one is a question of discretion, and I support a lot of the national standards that are in Common Core, mm -hmm. and uh, and I was happy that our state adopted them and and helped in, in in pushing for that. And so I'm not against the idea of creating national standards from which states may adopt through their option, but not all states may want to do that. And and if parents think their children are are being sacrificed by that, then they should move to a state like ours that is adopting national standards. Mm -hmm. But I still think we need to give the discretion to each state because not every parent wants to deal with that and not every student wants to. And then if they move on to college and they find that, that they need to catch up on those things, then they'll have the opportunity to do that. But I still think education has traditionally been a state um, decision. And for the most part, while standards may be adopted that are national in nature, that it should be left to the states. Okay. Uh, what's your uh, current views on choice? I, I know there's a group called uh, Step Up for Students, I think, and they help to provide scholarships for low-income uh, students to uh, attend private school, and then, of course, you have charter schools. So the whole notion of choice, what, what are your views on, on that? Does it hurt public education? Does it? Which way should we go with this? Well, I think the key is that these options should be left open, uh, like with private schools and charter schools, and they serve a function. Um, but they are the alternate programs. The base program is the public school program. And so our first responsibility is to make sure that our public schools are funded and that we provide a high quality education like is required in our Florida Constitution. That being said, there is room, because the public school isn't for everybody, for people to choose to go to charter schools or, or to go to private schools. But we should be funding everything proportional to the makeup that they are in our education system. For instance, public schools are the vast majority of all schools that we have. Mm -hmm. So we need to step up to make sure they are well-funded each year and that we don't have, because of 
well-connected groups representing certain schools like charter and, and private schools that they get a disproportionate amount of funding because of those connections. But at the end of the day, they're a part of the Florida education system and they need to stay a part of the Florida education system. Okay, so you're, you're okay with uh, giving uh, parents choice. And to me, that, that, that sort of makes sense too because you can't put all kids into one box and use uh, one system that will work for um, each kid. Right, and so I, my point is we just, we don't make major sacrifices the public school system or the traditional public school system to advance those choices, we do it all proportionate to where they are as a percentage of the whole, and, uh, and, but keep those, those options viable for the students who want them. Well, thank you, sir. We Thanks certainly appreciate you coming on and joining us, and uh, keep up the uh, good work that you're doing, and I uh, hope that uh, bill for the teachers uh, really passed. I'm sure they would appreciate that. Uh, stay tuned. Uh, our next guest will be Rick Roach in the following segment. We'll be right back. This show is brought to you by Boricua Beer, coming to your local retailer in September. My name is Ninmari Zapata, and I am a Latina role model because I believe that you can overcome any circumstances that come in your way and be the best version of yourself. Hello, I'm Sandra Rivera, and I'm a Latina role model. Whatever your struggles are in life, whatever you don't have or don't have access to, don't use that as an excuse for not pursuing your dreams and moving forward. Get out of your own way and get out of your comfort zone and you will be amazed at the growth that you will experience. Hi, and I'm Altero and I'm a Latina role model. And I wanna tell you, cut your excuses in half and face your fears. Fears are, are holding you back to becoming who you are meant to be in this world. Everybody has the potential to become whoever they decide to do. Follow your passion, follow your dream, and you'll be happy always. Good evening, welcome to another edition of EDU TV. I'm Greg Perkins, I am your host, and today's guest is Mr. Rick Roach. Good to see Democrat you, candidate, District 13. Welcome. Hey, glad to be here. Thanks okay. for inviting me. How's the campaign going? It's, I'm having a blast. I'm having the time of my life. Okay. Uh, I'm kind of a, running it in old traditional fashion, one-on-one -on -one with people, selling a vision, getting their ideas, uh, putting a good, solid platform together, and um, I just can't tell you how, how proud I've been of the success in the campaign. Mm -hmm. Now, I know you, you're going to focus on a lot of uh, economic issues, some other thing, but education seems to be your passion. What is your passion for education come from? Well, the, you know, education has been my life, <clears throat> but uh, it's, I'm, I'm proud to tell you that I believe that if we fix education, mm -hmm. we will fix Florida. Okay. And with that, I mean the economy. Uh, you know, as I branched out into the top four voter issues, which has been education, good jobs, mm -hmm. health care, and safety, which is crime, of course, uh, I found that education is the connector of all three of those. Mm -hmm. So that has mm -hmm. helped me to put together this four-block campaign. And, uh, boy, it just makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. Education is the key to that. Mm -hmm. And a lot of discussion going on about uh, testing. And, you know, I, I've done some homework. And it, and it seems to me you don't want to abolish testing. You just want to make it better and use it as a measure to assess students where they are as opposed to punishing them. So, so tell me about the components of your campaign, what that's going to look like versus what we currently have with the uh, Wales to new um, FSA now. And people seem to think there's just maybe a little bit too much testing. So what are you proposing that looks different from what we have? Well, Greg, you know, I wish I had said what you just said, because mm -hmm. that's perfect. That leads into what I'm doing. I, someone asked me, they said, Rick, if you were on the Senate, what's the first bill you would file that would get the most gains for Florida? And, it, you know, in two seconds I came up with that. I had not thought about it. But what I would do is I would simply file a bill that says any use of a standardized test mm -hmm. to measure kids, teachers or schools must be used exactly the way it was intended to be used and written 
as far as the specifications on the test. If we did that, if we simply used testing the way that was it was designed to be mm -hmm. used, you would open up Florida's economy. And I, right. I know that's a big thing to say, and I've got back uh, facts to back that up, but that's, that's really all it is. If we buy an automobile, nobody expects that to go underwater. Mm -hmm. uh, if you buy a toaster, uh, it's not a microwave. Right. And if you buy a standardized test, it's not designed to be used as an end-all, be-all instrument and it says so right in the directions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that, if you did that, you would open up the entire um, school grading system, which would allow teachers once again to teach. Mm -hmm. Because the, the relationship between a child and their teacher with a good curriculum and good teaching strategies is golden. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it, as long as you have that as your major criteria and use standardized testing where it belongs, you'd have all the, all the rationale in the world to really develop good students, which is your, your workforce. Mm -hmm. if, if you clog that up, then you clog up Florida's workforce, and that's exactly what's happening. We have a talent gap in Florida with, with over 200,000 jobs open which are good paying jobs and we can't put Floridians in it. Now that's a problem. Mm -hmm. Which is, uh, leads me to another uh, component of your platform, which is as a result of education, you want to give kids choices, vocational, <coughs> technical, college. So talk a little bit about that, about how those things work together. Well, because we misuse standardized testing, it requires the use of 17,000 teachers in Florida that teach test prep courses. Mm -hmm. Those 17,000 teachers, if they were repurposed into teaching uh, elective courses that match up with jobs or mm -hmm. kids' interest levels and their talent levels, you would have an incredible, an incredible outpouring of, of talent coming in, a talent pipeline coming into Florida. <coughs> So that's really what I'd like to do is match up kids' interest levels early on in the secondary schools with potential jobs mm -hmm. and, and then create those training opportunities for kids in, in schools because only 75% 75, 75 of our kids uh, do not go to a four-year college. Okay. And half of your good-paying jobs in Florida do not require college. Right. So the setup is perfect. It's just you've got to get the misuse of testing out of the way so we can open up those avenues for teachers and kids and match it up. You know, my grandmother used to say, there's a lid for every kettle. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that applies to Florida students and the jobs. And, mm -hmm. and if you just match up their interest and talent levels with what's out there, right off the bat, you're feeling Florida's employers with good talent that comes mm -hmm. homegrown. And if we have a homegrown workforce, you're going to draw more and more companies to Florida because that's the number one reason they don't come, is they don't have an educated workforce to attach to. Yeah, there are a lot of middle class jobs such as uh, uh, the, the guys who work on your, your, your <coughs> ACs, uh, carpenters, and those are, it just seems that a lot of kids aren't pursuing those. So maybe within the schools we need to do a better job of, like you're saying, of matching kids up who, who may say, yeah, maybe college is not for me. However, I'm still skilled in this particular area. Well, most of them are saying college is not for me. Mm -hmm. Most of our kids are saying that, <clears throat> and that's, that bears out with the research. So here's an example. We need 10,000 auto techs in Florida in the okay. next five years. We don't have them. We need 10,000 construction workers that pay good wages with health benefits. We don't have them. Wow. I'm telling you, they're in the schools and they're trapped with the misuse of testing. So those are positions that can be filled immediately with just another, probably a year or a year and a half of industry cert certification. Now look at the STEM jobs that are open, yep. science, technology, mm -hmm. engineering, and math. There's 65,000 job openings in Florida. Half of them do not require a four-year degree. Mm -hmm. So you've got a route for college gra uh, graduates and you've got a, a route for non-college graduates in those STEM positions. And it's silly for those companies to recruit out of state, out of country, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when the kids are right here. Right. Again, I want Florida to be the home of the homegrown workforce. Mm -hmm. We have that. The potential's here. It could be, it could be implemented in a year. Mm -hmm. Now, do you think that the whole testing thing kind of accidentally just grew beyond control? Because it seems now, I, I read a lot of this stuff, and it seems that almost the companies, the testing industry, it's almost driving the assessments. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think that it's happened very, very slowly, methodically, and purposely. I think oh, wow. over the years. I didn't catch on till about four or five years ago that something was wrong because 
we weren't moving the needle at all. So right. I do think I, the only rational answer I can give people for why we do what we do in education today has to be for reasons other than good education. It's got to be for some type of a corporate takeover or private entity because it's not doing us any, any we're, we're, we're not following any of the research in, in what we know about good education. Mm -hmm. And th there's no rationale for that. So I do think the testing companies are pretty much controlling the, the market. I think the tail is wagging the dog. Uh, as soon as that stops, you're going to see great things happen to Florida. If that doesn't stop, I don't predict anything but more and more people needing subsidies from the human services area and I see us building more prisons. And mm -hmm. I, hate to, I hate to say that, but I think that can be changed overnight with just simply doing things the way they need to be done. Yeah, because what a lot of people don't realize is that the prison population is directly correlated to your ability to be literate and to be a good reader. Yeah, I didn't call it the classroom to prison pipeline. Right. That's being called there by many, many people. Right. But we do know that when kids are not successful early on in school, mm -hmm. they're heading toward a poverty or a prison pipeline. And that, that's because there, and there's because we simply are mainlining kids down one area of assessment, which was never designed to be used that way. And would that be the college test prep route? That's the mm -hmm. test prep route. I mean, that's, that's what we're doing is forcing kids into those areas. Our 1,000 high schools in Florida are nothing more than really test prep. They're, they're college prep institutions, which is great for the college-bound kid. Mm -hmm. But again, 75% of the kids don't go to those colleges. So mm -hmm. you've really eliminated an entire group of kids, the majority of kids, from opportunities that would help them grow and, and contribute to the economy. Mm -hmm. Now, where are you on, I see that Florida's made some strides, and it seems like maybe at a national level, you have the vouchers, you have the charter schools, and you still have strong public schools. Sometimes I don't like when people say, oh, our education is so bad. I'm like, it, no, we have some really good, solid public schools. So where are you on all three of those entities working together to give parents uh, choices and more options? Well, I think charter schools, and I was the, uh, on the school board when we, um, when we gave the first charter to okay. Orange County. And initially they were they were really the purpose was excellent. They mm -hmm. were designed to uh, to start up and do something other than what traditional schools were doing, kind of an experimental schools, uh, innovative schools, which mm -hmm. was great. It was great and that's the first five or six that we spit out in Orange County Public Schools were just that. Mm -hmm. uh, that really is where the intention should have stayed. Now, okay. we're, uh, now we've grown to the point where we're creating charter schools that really don't do much different than our, our regular traditional schools. We've lost the innovative piece of it, mm -hmm. uh, and that we could use a lot of. I can't, I can't even begin to get, tell you how excited I would be to allow kids to use their creative, in, in, innovative entrepreneurial skills in, in, uh, in, in our education today and have schools that really allow that to happen. And we've, uh, we've, we've, we've knocked that out. So we've lost the purpose, I think, of a lot of our school choice with mm -hmm. that regard. Uh, there's a lot of uh, p opportunity there, but if you don't, if you don't use it appropriately, right. uh, then it doesn't work. Now, but I, it seems that there's some momentum because I, I think they eliminated, what, at least one of the tests this year, and they're going to take it, maybe eliminating some more of those for next year. What you're getting is the public, the public is beginning to get aware of okay. things. Now the awareness level is there, and I'm just loving it. I used to be on the battlefield fighting like crazy four or five years ago. Now I get to get in the bleachers a little bit, and I mm -hmm. get to watch a whole bunch of people fighting this thing because the knowledge piece is there. Well, thank you, sir, for joining us again. It's been a pleasure, and we will be following your campaign uh, if you want to. Tell the people where they can find more information about. Uh, you just go to rickroachforsenate.com. You can find out all the contact information to, uh, to uh, pick me up, and I would be happy for you to join me or allow me to buy you a cup of coffee and tell you what's going on. Thank you, sir. And thank you for this segment of EDU TV. Stay tuned for our second segment. This show is brought to you by Boricua Beer, coming to your local retailer in September. I am for the child who's had seven addresses in a single year because she's in foster care, because her father abused her, and her mother, 
her mother couldn't believe her. She is the child I am for. I am a volunteer child advocate. I am you. Florida residents call toll-free 866-341-1425.